Great. Well, good morning, everybody. I was looking at the participant list and I didn't see any unfamiliar names. So um, you all know me. Otherwise, I'm calling myself Judy England, but a lot of you know me as Yoga Judy. So I'm the one that does the yoga classes and you might also see me on some of the walks. I'm the senior health education coordinator for the NORC. And um, it really struck me the other day because come November, I'll be with the agency for eight years, mm. which is really quite exciting for me. So anyway, so today we're gonna talk about a subject that's near and dear to all of our hearts, aging well, what does it mean? And I don't know about you, but you know, when I turn 40, eh, no big deal. 50, okay. 60, okay. But 70, which I turned four years ago, I'm like, how in the heck did that happen? I wasn't upset as much as I was surprised. You know, how did that 30 year old with young kids turn into the grandmother, the great grandmother who's looking at me in th at the mirror. So I would wager that many of you had a similar reaction to as the years roll by. So we're gonna begin our little adventure here by doing a little time traveling. So I'm gonna ask you to just think back you know, when you were younger, maybe five or six or seven, and who were your friends? Where did you live? Who was in your family? Did you go on vacation with your family? What about the holidays? All of those kinds of things. And now move ahead a little more to maybe your teenage years. When were you dating? Where'd you go to school? Were you thinking about a career? Um, all of those things. What, what about your first date, your first apartment, all of those kinds of things. And then moving further ahead, the work that you did, the family that you had, the people that you knew. So fast forward a little bit more to where you are right now, but don't stop there. Try to project ahead five years, maybe 10 years, maybe 12 or 15 years, can you envision what your life is going to be like at that point? I lost the... No, I just stopped talking. <laughs> oh, you heard me. I'm that, was, that was supposed to be a thoughtful pause, Lenore. <laughs> no, it keeps, let me just, it keeps coming up the telephone. A picture of the telephone. I want to get on that couldn't see me. That's what I don't know what to do. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, so probably I, I, I once heard somebody say that somebody who was older talking to somebody who was younger, the older person said, I've been your age, but you've never been my age. So it's easier to reflect back and remember we, maybe the, maybe the bits and pieces of the memory are not exact, but we have pretty good recall. We just don't have a crystal ball to look into the future, do we? So when I was preparing this program and I first did it as a keynote speech for the Schoharie County Office for Aging, they had a, a big conference. And so I gave this as the, as the keynote speech. When I started researching it, there was no end of information out there from health planners, government offices, uh, gerontologists, and my own personal experience with moving into seniorhood. So when I was growing up, these are all family pictures, by the way, and I'm not gonna tell you who they are all, but if you look carefully, you see a picture of me when I was about nine or 10. <laughs> <laughs> Marla's smiling. So I was very fortunate was when I was growing up because both of my grandmothers lived well into their 90s. My dad um, worked until he was in his 80s. I had lots of seniors in my life and it was, it was wonderful to have them. They were my companions. They were my friends. They were my role models. 
And maybe they weren't living the kind of life I'm living now, but they certainly were there to give me a lot of support and I learned a lot from them. And given the ages of the members of my family, I guess you could say we've got longevity in the family. So uh, my dad, as I said, my dad worked into his 80s and I think I'm following in his footsteps because retirement is definitely not on the horizon for me, at least in the immediate future. So what do we know about the number of older people in this country? What do the statistics say? It's pretty impressive. Well, we know, first of all, that people are living far, far longer than they did four decades ago, 30 years longer. And the average life expectancy has certainly increased, 79 for women, 72 for men. And the amazing thing is that the number of people 65 years or older will be one in five by 2050. And not only that, but if you're 65, you can expect to live a good number of years longer. And the oldest of the old group is the most rapidly growing segment of the population. Pretty exciting, isn't it? So what does that all mean to have all those gray haired, older, wise people around us? It means we're a force to be reckoned with, right? right. I was doing some reading on um, the elections and senior voters and um, an amazing 71% of people over 65 voted in the 2016 election. So I think we can pat ourselves on the back that we are making our voices heard politically and in every other way. So another way to look at seniorhood is think about the number of years you've spent as an infant, a baby, a child, a teenager, an adult, it well might be that your senior years are the largest portion of your life. And would you be able to predict what that life would look like if you were back in your 30s or 40s? So the problem with living a long time is that extra years don't necessarily translate to quality years. Um, and I also love the saying, it's not, it's the life in your years that matter, not the years in your life. And I think we would all agree with that. So the CDC in 2015 did a study of the number of people age 65 and older who have chronic health conditions. And we're talking about things like heart disease, diabetes, um, arthritis, cancer, those kinds of things. So 85% of us have at least one. A little more than half have at least two and about a quarter of us have three or more of these chronic conditions. And I'm sure you're thinking of your own health history at this point. So another group the MacArthur Foundation did a longitudinal study of high functioning adults age 70 to 79. I think there was about a thousand people in, in the survey. And they looked at what were the key elements if we wanted to not just survive into our senior years, our older years, but to thrive. And they identified three main things, to avoid disability and disease, to main cognitive and physical functioning, brain and physical health, and to stay involved with life and living. And I think, you know, that's kind of like, duh, who wouldn't want those things at any age, particularly as we get older. When I was preparing this program, I um, sent out a message to my Facebook friends, and I've got lots of them on Facebook, and I said, what is it, if I say to you, what does it mean to age well, what would you tell me? And I got a lot of good responses that basically echoed these things that the MacArthur Foundation identified. But this was one particularly from a friend of mine. She said, I think that aging well is never giving up on the option that you can do X or Y, whatever, and taking 
uh, things are possible when a person takes step to protect and enhance their physical and mental well-being. And then as a tagline, she put on, I just turned 59 and Judy, I want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought that was pretty pretty good. And most of the responses I got from people on Facebook were very, very similar. So what is our program going to look like today? This is our outline, what the sections we're going to cover. And what I'd like to do is pause at the end of each section and maybe open the microphone so you can ask questions, you can put in your comments, whatever. A lot of information to be covered, which is why I sent everybody that resource guide. Did y'all get that? Okay, well, if uh, Rima, you just registered, so we'll send it out to you later. But there's, there's books and there's articles that are wonderful, supportive reading, and that I'm going to refer to during this talk. So number one, your biology is not necessarily your destiny. So we know that genetics play a part in how we're going to age, but what is that and what is epigenetics? And we're going to talk about that. Number two, we're gonna say, talk about taking care of the basics. And by that, I mean nutrition, exercise, stress management, all of those things that we need to be concerned about at any age, but particularly as we do age. Use it or lose it. And that relates to your physical well-being, your mental acuity, all working together. Last but not least, watch your language. We're going to talk about the pervasive and damaging effect of ageism in this country. So, your biology is not your destiny. So we know that um, within us, we carry a genetic history that goes back eons to prehistoric times. And they can give us a clue as to how to continue to live our best life into um, this century. We were hunter-gatherers. We were always on the move. We were eating what was fresh, what was available. We were dealing with short-term immediate stressors like predators, health issues, injuries, that kind of thing. And we got together in groups to cooperate in order to ensure our survival. So all of those things are hardwired into us in some way. Plus, we have our own personal history of genetics. I mean, think about your own families. If there's a history of diabetes, if there's a history of heart disease, cancer, those kinds of things, we do carry that within our own genetics. So, is our life script written by our genetics? So yes and no. One of the books I refer to um, in the resource guide is a book by Dr. Roger Landry and it's called Live Long and Die Short. And um, I like that very much. And Dr. Landry says that yes, our Eons of genetic history is very, very important because they have changed far less than what we need to do and the world that we're living in in the 21st century. So we need to tap into that, we need to understand it, and we need to respect it in order to live our best life. But then on the other hand, our genetics are not necessarily our destiny because there's a powerful force out there called epigenetics. Now you may or may not be familiar with that term, but what it simply means is that for many of us, the genetics we carry can be turned off or on based on the lifestyle choices that we make. For a very good example, think about type two diabetes. We may have a long family history of that, but if we manage our exercise and our diet well, we may never actually develop the full-blown condition. 
So I'm also going to be referring from time to time to a little structure in your DNA. And you know, your DNA is where it all is. It's the, that molecule that unwinds to, de to replicate itself. So at the end of each DNA strand is a little part called a telomere. And research has been going on very recently about looking at people's telomeres to see how they are aging. So in the process of replicating, of winding and unwinding over our lifespan, these little end pieces tend to break off. And so they're no longer carrying the perfect information to replicate. It's like, here's a good, here's a good analogy. If you think about your shoelaces, at the very end of your shoelaces, there's a little uh, plastic or metal piece. I think they call it an anglet. And if you've had those shoes for a long time, sometimes that little piece falls off and the shoelaces begin to fray and get a little shabby. That's what happens with your telomeres over time. But it's not just the natural course of aging that can shorten your telomeres. There are certain behaviors we can engage in that will shorten them as well. So more than pills and surgery, we need to look at our lifestyle choices and also pay attention to our beliefs and our attitudes towards aging. Here's some very interesting research. Does our attitude toward aging impact how we actually do age? And I wanna to refer to some research that was done by Becca Levy. She's an associate professor of epidemiology and psychology at Yale School of Public Health. And she presented some very compelling evidence against this. So let's look at the bad news first. People who had negative attitudes towards aging had worse performance in memory later in life. They also had a greater loss of hippocampus volume when they age. Now, what does that mean? The hippocampus is an area of your brain that deals with long-term memory, as well as your reactions and feelings about things. So if that starts to shrink, you can see how that would impact on your life. And also, they also had a greater buildup of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles in the brain. And those are the markers for Alzheimer's disease. So let's look at the good news. People who had positive attitudes towards aging had a 44% lower risk of developing dementia over the next four years. They also had a lower risk of developing dementia, even if they had the genetic marker, which is known as APOE4, for developing this disease. So there you go with the whole genetic link. Is it destiny or is it a choice? So there's a greater um, impact there in the attitudes and beliefs we have. Now, certainly there's more research that needs to be done on this. And it's easy to see that if you have a positive attitude towards growing older, don't you think you'd be more inclined to take care of your health in general? If you're not willing to hang up your shingle at 65 and say, I've got a lot more years to do stuff, to be on this planet, I'm gonna take care of what I eat, I'm gonna get my exercise, I'm gonna keep my brain sharp. So I'm not saying that attitude alone is gonna keep you safe but it is very compelling evidence. Also, um, the other day I was doing some more reading. Uh, Patricia Boyle, who is connected with the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, she talked about um, people talking about, they did uh, some longitudinal studies on purpose and meaning in life. So they did uh, self-reporting, asking people, did they feel that their life had meaning, that their life had purpose? And they followed them over 10, 15 years. 
Now understand that the only definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's can be done post-mortem when they actually look at the brain and see the plaques and tangles that are in there. They have tests they can run to see if you're developing dementia, but the definitive diagnosis can only happen after death. But anyway, when they looked at the people who participated in the studies, those people who reported high senses of purpose and meaning in their life, even if their brains had these plaques and tangles, which might have indicated dementia, they functioned at a much higher level than could have been predicted by what they saw in a microscope. So before we get into the next section, what I'd like to do is pause, open the mics, and have a few reactions. There's a lot of information there. What do you think? If people want to unmute themselves to say anything, feel free. Or if you don't know how, let me ask me. Mute. Stop video. A lot of information that we went through very quickly. It all makes sense, Judy. Melanie, I hear your lovely voice. I don't see your beautiful red braids. Oh, Hi. Uh, maybe it's because the angle of my iPad. I'm riding my exercise, so. Oh my gosh, can she's. You... <laughs> <laughs> can, can you see me now or no? I can see the top of your head, but that's fine. I can hear you. So, what do you? What okay. would? What's your reaction to all that, Melanie? I'm confirming it because. I come from a long line of people with heart disease. And although, as you know, I had the tumor um, two years into your working at, at uh, JFS, but uh, six, over six years ago. Um, and other than having had the tumor out, I don't have the um, issues in my... Um, arteries. I don't have blood pressure issues, knock on wood. Um, I have complete vita vitality and joy in life. And it's because of those positive attitudes and engagement um, that we're going to discuss more about as we go along. So um, I want to confirm that doing the things that give you joy, having a positive attitude, being connected, exercise, yeah, not enough to kill yourself, but enough so you've always got the circulation going um, and getting those endorphins and stuff. Um, so I just wanna confirm that if we do those things, the quality of our life is, it's, it's through the roof, so. I, I and, have a question. Yes. Okay, um, this is family history. I hear from my sister-in-law, oh, we have sugar in the family. We have sugar in the family. That's North Country for diabetes. And you say, did anybody ever get tested? And then the, everybody's face goes blank. How do you handle that? You know, um, how, and I know it's Holly. I recognize your voice. Right. Um, the problem is, as my sister-in-law used to say, you gotta wanna, you gotta wanna. I mean, there is no end of information out there. And I'm not just talking about the professional journals. I'm talking about what's in the lay press. I'm talking about what's in AARP magazine. I'm talking about the health pages in the Times Union. And there are some people who are resigned to the inevitable, and they also don't want to be told that, hey, there's a good chance you won't develop the full-blown disease if you take the actions that you need to take right now. Because we don't love change, do we, Holly? Well, uh, no. <laughs> okay. So okay, I, I see where you go. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. Hit somebody else, okay? <laughs> I appreciate it. I don't want okay. to take up more time. 
Okay, I wish I had a magic bullet that transforms intention into action. If I did, I would be a millionaires right now. Anybody else have a comment or a question? Can I say, it's Lenore, I know you don't see, can you hear me? I can see mm -hmm. you and I can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, age is a number. It's how you take it. I mean, I'm not young anymore, but I don't think about it. I try to enjoy, my attitude is good, maybe because I've had a good life overall. And I try to enjoy everything and enjoy each day, whatever years I have left, that's it. That's how I look at it. And I'm laughing because I had to, and I still feel I'm a good driver. My reflexes are still good. And I had to renew my license last month and they renewed my driver's license for 10 years. So they know I'm going to live for 10 more years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that gets me so angry. I'm very, I could, I'm still agile and I could do things. But there are people of my age who should not be driving. And how could they give a license to people this age for 10 years? So, but as I say, number, you know, age is just a number and it's your attitude in life. That's all. You know, Lenore, I, I work for 20 years as a massage therapist and I've been a nurse for over 40 years. So I've seen a lot of people and, and I'm struck by the different ways in which people age physically, emotionally, psychologically. And, you know, quite clearly there were some people who were old at 40. And yeah. there are other people who are, are vital, engaged, active into their 80s and 90s. So it, it's so you can't make any generalization about people age. And I think that's one of the things I want everyone on this call to come away with today is that we have options. We don't need to hang up things at 65, there's still the option to change and improve and grow. So, and Judy, um, Judy yes. I to say that I always look forward to Lenore's jokes. She never lets me down. <laughs> Lenore, Lenore has the best jokes and she, her memory is great. She even remembers the punchlines every time, which is just outstanding to me. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> All right. You want to laugh? I, I, I haven't told a joke in a long time because there's no socializing here. So what happened recently, somebody said something about Christmas. I said, oh, I have a great joke. And I told her the joke, but I said, wait a minute. And I had the punchline. Something's wrong. I forgot the beginning of the joke. So you see, I did forget. <laughs> <laughs> but that in itself was good for a good laugh, wasn't it? Yes. All right. Marla, if you'd be good enough to mute the mics now, that would be great. So we get to the next section, which is kind of obvious. In order to be well, in order to feel well, in order to live well, we have to take care of the basics. So no matter who you are, how old you are, you are what you eat and you are what you do. So no matter what the fad diets say, we need to eat the right kind of food to keep our bodies and our minds functioning at peak efficiency. And no matter what our physical limitations are, we do need to get some movement, some exercise and good quality sleep. And no matter what our age, stress is always a part of life and we certainly need to get better at managing that. So here's the slide that I love. And, and this, um, Holly, you can't see this because you're on your phone, but there's, a, there's a, a waiting room and there's one entryway that says pills and surgery. And on the other side, it says lifestyle change. So the line for pills and surgery goes way out the door and there's nobody waiting in line for the lifestyle change. So as I mentioned, we're not people who like to embrace change. And when we find that in order to manage our conditions, we do need to make some changes, we're not willing to love and embrace it. So when it comes to exercise, um, a orthopedic surgeon friend of mine used to say, life is movement and movement is life. 
our bodies are designed to move. And just by way of how important that is, did you realize that statistically, if you spend a week on bed rest, that's equivalent to aging two full years. One week of bed rest, two years of aging. That's pretty impressive. One of the other books I refer to and that I, I just love is a book called The Blue Zones by Dan Buettner. And it's in the resource list. Yeah, Melanie's got a thumbs up. Dan Buettner went around the world and he looked at a variety of cultures that had large percentage of their population, not just living into their hundreds, but thriving into their hundreds. And he found many commonalities in these five different cultures. Um, they were active and they didn't go to the gym. They didn't have personal trainers. They took care of the homes. Maybe they gardened. Maybe they played with their grandchildren. They walked and walked and walked. And they ate a diet high in plant-based foods, natural foods. As a matter of fact, in Okinawa, which was one of the blue zones, um, there's a practice known as Hara Hachi Bu. And what that simply means is it's considered a good thing when you eat, to eat until you're only 80% full. Now, why is that a good idea? Number one, it takes 20 minutes from the first bite of food for your blood sugar to raise high enough to shut off the hunger center in your brain. So if you're going back for that second plate of food before 20 minutes have passed, chances are you're going to eat too much. And the other thing is eating foods that are high in nutritional value and low in calories seems to statistically and research-wise have an impact on longevity. So again, we're going back to that little word we mentioned, the telomeres. They observed people who were obese versus people who were a little on the lean side. The leaner folks had longer telomeres, which means they were aging less rapidly. Now, this is not the same as extreme dieting. Anything in the extreme, whether it's exercise or dieting or any of those things, has the reverse effect on our telomeres. So what is this saying? Moderation. Isn't that a word we know and love? Moderation in all things. As I like to say, moderation in all things, including moderation, right? So talking about stress and the effects on the mind and body. Now, my guess is that if I took the cumulative age of everybody who was on this call today, it would be pretty darned impressive. So what I'd like you to do is take your hand, reach it around, pat yourself on the back, because you've already been through a lot of life's speed bumps. Maybe not perfectly, but successfully. And I like to refer to this. How many of you are familiar with this? This is called the Holmes Social Adjustment Scale. And it ranks life events by the amount of stress that they contribute to our life. And the important thing about that is the research indicates that the higher your cumulative score, the more likely you are to develop an illness within the coming year. Look at the events and look at what's number one on the list. Death of a spouse. How many seniors do you know who are dealing with the death of a spouse. This is such a significant marker for the onset of illness that there's even a, a condition known as the widowhood effect that significantly increases the risk of death within three months of losing a spouse. And then looking down the list, look at all of those other stress contributing factors and think about how many might relay 
to seniorhood, the death of a close family member, a personal injury or illness, a retirement, a major change in health, all of those kinds of things contribute. So stress can be dangerous. We all know that. But before we get too negative, you know there is an upside to stress. Did you know that? And I love the work of this writer and researcher. Her name is Kelly McGonigal. And she has a wonderful TED talk out that you can view um, on the internet. And it says, making stress your friend. And what she says is that in addition to the hormones that are released during stress, and many of them you know, there's adrenaline, there's epinephrine, there's cortisol, cortisol being the one that's been branded as the, the bad guy when it comes to the effects on the body over the long term. There are other chemicals that are released into the bloodstream, DHEA, which primes our brain for learning and oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. It's the hormone that mothers release when they nurse their babies. But oxytocin draws us to connect with other people to get support. So depending on how you view stress, whether you view it as a threat or as a challenge, you can have a very different response to when stress arises in your life. And I love what Kelly describes stress as. She says, stress is what arises when something you care about is at stake. So rather than saying, oh, this is happening, say, okay, so this is happening, so I might have to make some adjustments in my life. Find ways to manage stress on a daily basis, whether it's meditation, working in your garden, going for a walk, even crocheting, something that engages you and grounds you and practice it regularly. Don't just wait for stressful situations to arise. Make yourself a master. When you first notice those early signs of stress, whether it's the headache, the tension in your shoulders, the tight stomach, and let that be your go-to. I was watching another um, educational video the other day um, that was very, very good about how we heal and she was talking about stress and she said, we as human beings can only do one thing at a time. We can either grow or we can protect. And if we view stress as a threat, we are going to be shifted into protect mode and away from growth mode. So learning to review, to change the lens on which you view these difficult situations can be extremely helpful and developing the tools to help you manage. So again, it's time for me to just pause for a breath, take a drink of water and open the floor to your comments. So what do you think about all of that? What do you think about the basics? We talked about nutrition. We talked about exercise. We talked a little bit about all these cultures where people are living long, healthy lives. And we talked about stress. I can't tell you how much needlepoint I have completed during the past, what is it, six months? Um, it's absolutely true about a craft practice. Yep. Did you yep. I think, uh, you know, as I said, it, you know, it, people think that because I'm a yoga teacher, of course, I'm going to push for yoga and meditation. Yes, indeed, I am, because I think it's great. But anything you can do that absorbs you, and I bet when you're working on that needle point, you're not worrying about too much. You're just really focused on what it is you're doing, correct? What's happened is my mind has been freed up. Needlepoint, you have a painted picture on the canvas, which you cover with 
fibers. My mind has been freed. You don't have to follow the, their color. You can do anything, and that's important. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it, um, and also you're engaging your physical body. What happens sometimes when we get, most of what stresses us out is happening from the neck up, correct? It's our interpretation of a situation, not the situation itself. So if we can shift the focus of the energy to the physical body, whether it's doing needlepoint, going for a walk, eating a wonderful meal, those kinds of things, we ground ourselves and we get out of this potentially dangerous neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Judy, I, yeah. I ground myself also in learning new things. And during the uh, pandemic, started being part of a, um, a ukulele jam session once a week um, with a whole bunch of people online on Zoom. And learning a new instrument um, has been extremely rewarding and also connecting with new people. Um, I knew some of the people in the group, um, but those two things have been really, really great mindful practice, definitely getting lost in playing the, the ukulele. <laughs> I, I do Sudoku. When you're concentrating on getting those nine numbers in that square, the whole world disappears. And that's what I find. I, just, I have a book of a thousand medium and hard, and I just do a couple of them. And it, it's like, yeah. And, and, you know, and, and, right. And, I mean, it's so funny because I'm concentrating on getting those nine numbers into where they belong and everything else disappears. So I've been using that. And you know, and you know, Helene, it's, it's not that you're not paying attention to what's going on in the world. That's not it at all. But worrying about something is not the same thing as doing something about it, is it? So to try to release those things over which we have very little or no control is critical. And, um, yeah, I just, I, I love this, the um, actions that people take to bring their stress level down. And that's great. Yeah, my daughter-in-law does Sudoku too. And Melanie, you've given me a perfect segue into hey, our next Judy, section. Judy, just before, there's, um, Giovanni had put on the chat that he's made a robe out of knitting. And we've seen him knitting. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Giovanni, Giovanni comes to our meetings with his knitting. Sometimes, um, but during my own, during the COVID outbreak, I mean, during the outbreak, I had picked up knitting because I had learned from a friend how to do it. And so I made kind of a robe. Oh, I love it. It will be great oh. for the winter. Yes. It's it like the coat good. of many colors. <laughs> the Giovanni. coat of many colors. Yeah, there it is. And it's oh. A work in progress, but it's very long. <laughs> Uh, um, oh. Something else I've done during my time is uh, I'm very much into reading and <clears throat> I've gotten into reading uh, classic novels. So I've read Catcher in the Rye and I'm currently reading um, The Three Musketeers and this is oh. one of my, <laughs> my favorite reads. And that's one of my oh. favorite candy bars, too, Giovanni. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and fluffy. It's really good. I'm waiting for the candy bar to show up in the book. Because I think that's really the main purpose of it. Great uh, yeah, attitude, we... Giovanni. Great attitude. <laughs> Thank you. That's why we're glad to have him on board. He's a natural <laughs> fit with our, with our crazy team. He really is. For me, uh, as opposed to like trying to avoid what's going on outside, um, I just look at reading as I'm still here with everything going on, but it's a moment of diving myself into something else. Kind of like Helen and her Sudoku. Like she is, <laughs> Helen is aware of what's going on and she wants to fill those little squares in. Well, I want to finish the book and, and uh, like every time I finish a book, it feels good because it's something completed. It's something that you're seeing yeah. and feeling and doing. Uh -huh. Yeah, I always um, have thought, and it, it started when my children were young, and so much of what I would do would get undone within the next 30 seconds. So I always try <laughs> and do, <laughs> I try to do something every day that lasts more than five minutes. <laughs> and that's, that's a rule that I've held to all of these 74 years. 
you know, it's, it's, um, it's a good practice. And I just, I love what people are sharing here. So, all right, here we go. Use it or lose it, right? Have you ever heard that saying? And that goes for our physical bodies, our mental ability, our ability to learn, the sense of curiosity and wonder, all those things that keep us engaged and alive and make life fun. You know, and if we surrender to the fact, you know, like it's, uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I love what Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. So what do you choose to hold as your belief? Um, when I was 47 is when I went to massage school, okay? And it, I was probably the oldest person in the class. They were all in their 20s. They all had great short-term and long-term memories. And I was a nurse and I was still struggling with all the details of, of learning how to do massage and learning all the, the structures of the bones and the muscles and those kinds of things. But I had a passion to learn. And I think that's what's really important there. Even, so it, I graduated from massage school and I had a 20 year career as a massage therapist. And just think about it. I started working with the NORC eight years ago. You do the math. I'm 74 now. So I took on a new job when a lot of people are already thinking about or have already retired. What makes the difference? I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. I'm excited about what I do. Remember that comment about studying people who had a sense of purpose and meaning? And I think that's what really comes into play. So what is it that lights you up? What are you excited about learning? Uh, what are you curious about? What makes you want to dig deeper and learn more. Again, going back to the blue zones in Okinawa, which is another culture that has many over a hundred, excuse me, they talk about the ikigai. Or in Costa Rica, they say the plan de vida. What is your plan in life? What is it that motivates you? What is it you want to learn more? I'm trying to learn to speak Spanish. Melanie knows this. I've got a program on Duolingo. 95 days straight, Melanie. I've been practicing every day with my computer. Fabuloso. Learning, <laughs> learning, to, learning a new language and learning to play a musical instrument are two of the ones that rank right up there with preserving brain function as we age. That's been, that's been proven. Um, so don't be afraid to go for it. I mean, talk to an expert, go online. You know, you, I think with Google, you can be smarter than ever before. You can learn how to do anything on Google from brewing beer to playing the guitar, to learning to knit, to learning to draw. The world is at your fingertips. And if you're not computer savvy enough, get some help with that. And you can, you can really tap into it. Now we know that age is not a barrier. We have the potential for neuroplasticity. And I love that word. What does it mean? It means that those little neurons in your brain don't stop developing connections when you hit 50 or 60 or 70. Neuroplasticity is always there. We just have to tap into it. So here's some good examples of people that didn't necessarily confine. Do you know all those people in the picture? So on the um, far left is Charles Darwin. And he did not publish Origin of the Species until he was 50. Grandma Moses down in the lower right, she was 80 when she started painting. And she only started painting um, because she used to do needlework and her eyes weren't good enough to paint any, to sew anymore. <laughs> So she said, well, I'm not gonna hang up my hat. I'm gonna do something else. So she learned how to paint. Harlan Sanders down in the bottom, Mr. Kentucky Fried Chicken. He was 66 when he started his empire. 
over in the top right is Laura Wendell's Ida, Laura Engels Wilder, who published her first book in her 60s. And to the top eating a burger is Ray Kroc, Mr. McDonald's. And he didn't found his empire until he was 52 years old. So there you go. Um, so find people who are interested in what you like to do, you know, tap into that. One more quote I have about this that I, that I came across the other day that I thought was really wonderful. Um, and it has to do with being adaptable. And E.M. Foster wrote that we must be willing to let go of the life we have in order to have the life that's waiting for us. Now, I don't know about you, but there's been a lot of changes in my life, some of them associated with aging, some of them associated with changes in relationships and those kinds of things. But to stay locked in the past prevents us from moving into the future, whatever that future is. Don't go it alone. Friendships, you know, the Beatles sang a song, I get by with a little help from my friends. Well, the Beatles are right because the importance of social connection and interaction to our mental and physical health cannot be denied. Going back to that first slide where we talked about early man, remember one of the characteristics in our genetics is this need to connect with other people. We did it for our survival. And believe me, surviving in the 21st century, we need a lot of friends just as well. And the quality of these friendships is really important, more so than the quantity. A lot of changes come about with age. People, people pass away, people move away, uh, retirement. And then there's this whole other layer that's superimposed on that with the virus that keeps us somewhat isolated from connecting with other people. Again, in Okinawa, Dan Buettner wrote about a practice that happens every day in that community. It's called the Mokai, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, but people get together, people who are seniors get together in a community every day. They talk, they share stories, they share information. And um, so it's really, really important to them and it keeps everything going very, very nicely. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of connections, but hopefully everybody has what I would call the two o'clock in the morning friend, the one you can call at two o'clock in the morning without worrying that they're gonna hang up on you. So a little bit of research about social connections. Julian Holt Lundstedt said, social re relationships influence the health outcomes for adult. 50% more likelihood of longevity if you have strong social connections. And look at the next comment, the equivalent risk of smoking for heart disease and cancer. Many of you might remember Dean Ornish. He wrote a book on reversing heart disease, but not just heart disease. He talked about other chronic health conditions. And he talked about how people who are isolated or chronically depressed are at a much higher risk and that strong social connections, any kind of love and intimacy, promote health and healing. So very, very, very important. Now, I'm unhappy to say that um, we can't meet in person for yoga class. I love this class, we would get together. And it wasn't just that we were getting together and doing exercise, we formed a sangha, a community around the practice. And I try to keep that going as much as I can with our interactions on Facebook, but just to connect with people. If you haven't seen anybody in a while, pick up the phone, give them a call. Um, Facebook can be an incredible tool. I connected with a woman who I grew up next door to in Queens and we've reconnected our friendship and we catch up, we share stories from the past, but we also do new things together. I wanna say one word about friendships. If you think of friendships like a garden, 
sometimes you got to do some weeding. You know what I'm saying? We all have people in our life who are naysayers, who are negative all the time. And make no mistake that hearing this over and over can have a negative influence on your own mental health. So whenever possible, try to select being with people who are positive, who are uplifting, who urge you to just be engaged and don't worry about the naysayers. So I know we're gonna run a little bit long. I hope that's okay with people. If we could just pause here for a few comments on not going it alone. Boy, I miss those guys in the class. That's a great picture, isn't it? So what about social connections? What have you been finding? And is there anything you wanna share about how you've been working with the difficulties now that we have social distancing? I'm fortunate that I live in the old Hef Shalom apartments. All of my children are way, you know, once in Israel, once in Kansas City. And I tell them I'm not alone. And I'm not alone because I have friends in the building. Uh, even, uh, even on the floor that I, I, I said, God forbid I need something at 2 o'clock in the morning. I could knock on any one of those doors and somebody would be there to help me. And I think it's reassuring to my children so they worry less about me being alone. Because I, I tell them I'm, I'm alone in my apartment, but I'm not alone alone. Right. Yeah. And I see you smiling as you're saying that, Helene. So it's, it's true, though. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I don't, you know, and I, you know, I have my connections from my synagogue. I have connections with Newark. I see uh, I see Rima on Zoom. <laughs> I've seen her in, in several months, but uh, that's the way it is. <laughs> I also um, have found that since the uh, pandemic, I take walks all the time, and I've gotten friendlier with the neighbors now than before because <laughs> everybody is home and everybody has a lot of time on their hands, and so. It's been good. I've, I've um, made friends with people in my neighborhood just from taking the walks. And um, um, of course, I mi really miss seeing Ali in person and um, all <laughs> the rest of the group from Newark. Um, but um, that, that's, that's been a good plus. But um, I've always been um, a social person and the computer too, with Facebook and everything, we, you know, with friends that you knew from high school and college and every once in a while somebody will um you know facebook me or stuff like that so it, it's all been um uh good right i sit on my front stoop and there's not a dog worker that goes by that doesn't want to tell you about their dog so i just yell <laughs> hey what kind of dog is that <laughs> and they'll talk <laughs> and one couple told me it's a cotton doulaire and I went, oh, please, Whoever heard of that outside the Westminster door? Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, dog, dog lovers really love to talk about their dogs. I, I think we even have a support group that we're starting um, in the NORC for dog lovers, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm correct, you Marla. Can't say, I'll come. I won't bring my dog, but I'll come. That's okay. That's okay. It should be... Um, yeah, it'll probably be in constant contact, but there is a dog lovers group and I guess they got together and some of them had dogs and some of them didn't, but there you go. And you oh. may hear my dogs barking at any point in the, in the program because they're wandering around. Judy, can I ask you a question? Where, sure. in Queens, where in Queens did you grow up? Because Cam I grew up in Bayside. Cambria Heights, which was the last town in Queens before you got to Elmont. Uh -huh. And the woman I connected with was my next door neighbor. She was the youngest of three kids. And now she lives over in Rensselaer. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's awesome. It's just awesome. So we, we go, we do the good old days, but, you know, we also do new stuff together. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been wonderful. 
Yeah. All right. Moving right along. Oh, watch your language. So the dangers involved in self-talk and ageism, you've heard it. There are people that say, well, I can't do that because I'm gonna tell you a little story. So a man goes to the doctor and he says, doctor, doctor, my right knee is just giving me fits. It hurts all the time. I'm having trouble going downstairs. You know, can you take a look at it and tell me what the problem is? So the doctor who's a young pup says to him, well, Mr. Jones, you're 75 years old. I don't know what you expect. And the man says, well, doctor, I beg to differ, but my left knee is also 75 years old and it's fine. So the point of all that is we need not to make assumptions. We make, you know, we've been told about the dangers of all of the isms, whether it's you know, sexism or racism or any of those other things that stereotype and limit our ability to see a person as a whole person. There's a woman, her name is Alana Officer, and she works for the World Health Organization, and she sees ageism as a very pervasive and insidious problem. And it is so much of a problem that it actually has effects on our health. You remember Rebecca Levy and her studies about attitudes and belief about aging and how it impacts perhaps the development of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So we begin with our own head. How do we view ourselves? Do we view ourselves as a whole person who just happens to be a certain age? Or do we become the age? How do we view ourselves? Um, you know, obviously, again, I think it's important that if we see that life is a continuum and maybe, you know, we're going towards one end of the continuum, but there's still the incentive there to take care of ourselves, to exercise, to eat well, to form those social connections, to manage our stress. All of that is important. We must not give in to the fact that age is a barrier to doing anything we care to do. Another thing about Okinawa, one of those blue zones, if you ask somebody in Okinawa how old they are, they're apt to lie about their age, but not in the way you think. They're apt to say they're older than they actually are because elders are respected, they are sought after, they are valuable assets and resources in the community. So just pretend you live in Okinawa. I like to tell people I'm 110. Don't I look great for my age? So anyway, I, I hope what your takeaway from our little chat is that I like to remember that my life is a choice. And I'm going to use an analogy that Dr. Landry used in his book. He said, do you want to be on a cruise ship? or do you wanna be on a sailboat? Now on a cruise ship, it's great, you know, but the captain is in charge of where you're going, what stops you're making, all of those things. On a sailboat, you're in charge. You have to be aware of what's going on and be willing to shift, pivot and adapt and keep making choices that keep you moving forward rather than just dealing passively with what comes your way. Be willing to contribute something to your community, not just receive. And that's the future I'm moving towards, I'm working towards, and I really hope you'll join me on that beautiful sailboat. And that's all I got. So let's open the floor to any final comments. Judy, do you want to stop? Judy, do you want to stop sharing your screen so we can just get everybody up on the screen? Is yeah, I think that would be great. And um, how do you feel about, should we stop the recording now or keep it going a little longer for questions? Well,